Anyway, with that, we're delighted to have Perry Purse with us here today with Purse Legal Services. So, uh, Perry, thank you for bringing uh, donuts. Thank you for being here to speak, and we're anxious to hear what you've got to say. It's great to be here. Thank all of you for uh, showing up this morning. My name is uh, Perry Persh. I've been practicing law for about 20 years. I uh, started out at the Nebraska Attorney General's office defending the state from what I characterize as frivolous lawsuits. Um, from there, I was in private practice working for a uh, tax and estate planning attorney, uh, my sister Elizabeth Persh. And of course, nobody can drive you crazy like your own family. I. Um, I was working on a master's degree in, in public administration and interning on Capitol Hill for Congressman Terry. Had a chance to go to work for him full time. Uh, spent a couple of years as legislative counsel to Congressman Terry. Came back as general counsel to the auditor of public accounts. Uh, moved over and became uh, deputy and counsel to the state treasurer. And then uh, went back into private practice for about 10 years. So I've been practicing law for uh, over 20 years now. Uh, last August, uh, August 1st, I started my own firm. And uh, in my legal career, I've done a lot with businesses. I've done a lot with estate planning. I've done a lot with uh, employment law, uh, personnel issues. And uh, I've done some criminal matters as some of my other clients were drug into court for various things. So I've, uh, I've litigated and I've done work in appellate courts, I've argued in front of the federal circuit, and so I have a pretty good background as far as uh, what to, uh, well, what small businesses, what entrepreneurs should be thinking uh, as they are going through the course of their day. And it's unfortunate, but you have to be thinking a lot like uh, Clint Eastwood in Million Dollar Baby, uh, his advice uh, to the fighter, Hillary Swank, uh, actress Hillary Swank's character. And do you remember what that is? If you've got my hand out, you have it in front of you. But he says, basically, protect yourself at all times. And that's really what a good attorney does as far as uh, teaching their clients how to think uh, like an attorney and how to act and conduct themselves pretty much at all times like a, quote, reasonably prudent person. Uh, the law provides for a cause of action against somebody who has harmed somebody else, even if you weren't directly breaking a law, if you were, if you were negligent, if you failed to meet a reasonable standard of care in the conduct of your affairs. The law presumes that each of us is going through our day always acting like reasonably prudent people. And uh, has anybody ever had a bad day? Maybe they were in a hurry. Um, so, one of the things that I like to do as a training exercise for my clients as they uh, think about their business and they think about creating new businesses, as they think about uh, business transition planning, et cetera, is to uh, try and imagine all of the key players in their lives, uh, in their business, dead, dying, getting a divorce, going insane, uh, hating you, uh, because these things happen and attorneys see it every day. So um, along those lines, estate planning is really important. Um, and as my sister used to say, 50 years ago, you'd go to an attorney's office for a will, and they would write your will, and they'd be like, OK, here's your will, and off you go. Uh, we really don't do that anymore. Uh, anymore, uh, attorneys have recognized that a person is likely to go through a period of disability or maybe even be on a vacation and be stranded somewhere because of a strike or something else. And, uh, and for those reasons, generally when we look at estate planning packages, we look at things like uh, powers of attorney for health care and financial matters so that if you were incapacitated, somebody could step into your shoes seamlessly, make decisions for your benefit without the need of going to court for a guardianship or a conservatorship which takes time and, and more money. Um, when it comes to estate planning, though, a, a will guarantees probate. Um, so if you want to avoid probate, there's other steps that estate planning attorneys can help you do as well. For example, look at your bank accounts. With your bank accounts, a lot of times you can add somebody as a signator on the account, giving them the authority to write checks for you if you're incapacitated. But it does not. Uh, uh, give them ownership of the account, 
and the account would not transfer to them on death. You can also make somebody a joint tenant on an account, in which case, uh, when somebody is a joint tenant with somebody else and one of them dies, the decedent's interest just basically treat, treated by the law as if it dissolves and there's only one person's interest remaining. Then there's also uh, POD or payment on death provisions that you can set up with an account. Uh, attorneys tend to favor those because if you put a, uh, let's say, a responsible child's name on an account with you, but you were in an auto accident, something like that, um, or uh, I should say your, your child was in an auto accident, something like that, and harmed somebody, and attorneys for the person who was harmed are looking for assets, they might be able to find the account that has your child's name on it. So uh, payment on death, uh, joint tenancy, um, Nebraska has what they call a transfer on death deed. All of these things act by what's called operation of law to transfer title upon the death of an individual and all of them avoid probate. Uh, probate is not uh, as scary as some people make it out to be. Uh, when it comes to trusts, which avoid probate oftentimes, I always say that they are uh, often oversold and underfunded. Um, if you have a trust and there are certain situations where a trust is just fantastic, um, great, but just make sure that your assets are titled into the name of your trust. Trusts are really beneficial where you have uh, people with children from prior relationships and they're going to maintain separate family property uh, for inheritance purposes, where you have a child who may be a uh, spendthrift or have a problem with alcohol or drugs. Uh, where you have a particularly large estate, where you have probate in, in, uh, in several states. All of these things are great candidates for a trust. But for somebody with a small estate, uh, $100,000, $150,000, odds are they may go through a period of disability and have to spend down their estate anyway. Uh, Medicaid is the largest provider of nursing home care in the United States. Uh, the spend down for Medicaid is $2,000. You can keep a house or a car if you have a, a spouse that is still using it, or if it's possible that you will return to your house. Uh, but, but for most people, they're going to spend down their, their estate if they're fortunate enough to live long enough. And really all probate does is it allows somebody, your personal representative, to step into your shoes, do an accounting of what you own, figure out who you owe money to, pay those people, and then distribute whatever's left to your beneficiaries if you've designated them in a will or if you haven't then to your heirs at law. So uh, for small estates $50,000 and less you can do it by affidavit. It's not too bad. I don't encourage people to use uh, intestacy which is not having a will as your estate planning tool unless you uh, really have no family and don't have much of an estate you're like Meh, I'm not worried about it. Um, for most of us, though, a will, durable powers of attorney for health care and financial matters are a good first step. And for some of us, uh, having a revocable living trust is a good step. And then for the uber rich, uh, you might even look at more things like charitable remainder trusts or life insurance trusts or something like that. Uh, most of us won't have that problem in our lifetime. So uh, turning over to the business side of things, I create a lot of businesses. It seems like I create one about once a week, once every two weeks for my clients. Uh, I'm different from some attorneys in the sense that I try and talk people out of using legal services where I can, whether it's uh, trying to keep them from filing a lawsuit or um, <clears throat> encouraging them not to do a filing for a corporation or an LLC simply because somebody told them to and they feel like, oh, uh, I think this is the right thing for me to do. Usually in most cases what I say is, is, have you ever tried to make a living at this business? Why don't you do it out of your garage or something like that for six months first? See if you enjoy it, see if you can make money at it before you start investing uh, time and expense in an attorney. And frankly, I work cheap. Um, but there is good reason to have an LLC or a corporation uh, generally, because the IRS allows you to determine how you want to be taxed, 
I recommend LLCs over corporations. And that is, uh, an LLC can be governed by an operating agreement, but it doesn't have a lot of the same corporate formalities. You don't have to worry about shareholders meetings and board of directors meetings. Uh, but the IRS will allow you to elect to be taxed as either an S corp or a C corp, depending upon your uh, objectives and still be a Nebraska LLC. So um, one of the great things about electing to be taxed as an S Corp is that, let's say that you are a successful small business, you make $100,000 net your first year. If you're a sole proprietorship, the, uh, the IRS is going to treat all of that as regular income. But if you are an uh, LLC that elected to be taxed as an S Corporation, you could pay yourself a reasonable salary, let's say that's $50,000, and then you could pay yourself dividends on the remaining $50,000. Uh, the dividends would avoid FICA taxes, uh, payroll taxes, which would save you about 15% off the top. Uh, one of the other great things about an LLC is, of course, limited liability. And uh, you have no idea, frankly, unfortunately, uh, whether or not you're going to get sued in business due to somebody else's carelessness or stupidity. Um, lawyers, uh, being what we are, we look for deep pockets. And uh, one of the uh, maxims that they teach you in law school is sue everybody and let them figure out who's negligent between them. So when I was a young lawyer, and I was much more idealistic than today, I would always think that under oath, the power and the majesty of the law would probably compel people to actually tell the truth and you'd have them break down in depositions and go, yeah, probably was my fault, I did that. No, uh, most times they double down actually, uh, which is really unfortunate. I, uh, it breaks my heart to take money from clients when I'm defending them from a frivolous lawsuit or, or when I am helping them prosecute a lawsuit because they were harmed and wronged and somebody is not taking responsibility for the harm or wrong. Um, but one of the things that each of you can do to protect yourselves as your business people is at the very least for your business affairs, you put it in an LLC, you put it in a corporate uh, entity, a business entity, and then if the entity goes bankrupt, your personal assets should not be at risk if you've done things correctly. <coughs> uh, the next most important thing that I tell my business clients is assume that you are going to not like your business partners in six months. And I say that because it, they are like uh, marriages. Uh, half of them end in a business divorce. Uh, success has many fathers. Failure is an orphan. And a lot of times uh, people have rose-colored glasses. They start talking with their friend on their business idea and how everybody's going to be rich and everything is going to be great and they don't have those really difficult conversations. What are you planning to do every day in furtherance of the business? And uh, what are we going to do if the business isn't making money? And who's going to leave? Um, I had a great phone call from a client yesterday. And she said to me, she has a master's in business, by the way, and I think that's part of it. But she, she called me up and she's like, I'm mad at you and I'm going to say something to you and I want you to wait till the end and then I'll give you a chance to respond. And I was like, wow, I love this woman already. That's like one of my best clients ever. She knows exactly what she needs to do. And uh, so anyway, we talked about a couple of issues and she was right about one and I explained why I was wrong and I thanked her for calling it to my attention. And then in the other one, uh, neither one of us was wrong. It was just a perception problem, and those things happen all the time. When you do business law, you have contract disputes. Two people sat in a room, heard the same thing. One of them came out of it with one thing. One of them came out of it with another thing. Doesn't mean that either one of them is a liar. It's just a, uh, a frailty of the human condition that we can hear something and take a different meaning out of it than somebody else. But you can help guard against that by making sure that you have written agreements. For an LLC, if you've got one, you've got partners, have an operating agreement. The operating agreement should imagine everybody dead, dying, going insane, getting a divorce, hating each other. Uh, it should have a mechanism in it so that if you can't agree, you have uh, 
a, a peaceful dispute resolution on what to do when, when you can't agree and you can't make a, a, a decision together. Um, it is really tough having business partners unless they're absolutely necessary. Generally, I advise my clients against it. But um, no business uh, that has become a success has got there without employees. And uh, employees can be even tougher than partners, business partners. Um, you guys have probably seen the bumper sticker. I uh, thought I wanted a job, but it turns out I just wanted the paycheck. Anybody seen that? Okay. Well, as a reasonably prudent person, as somebody who is uh, guard up protecting yourself at all times, uh, Having employees is a really, really difficult thing. I've, uh, I've done a lot of litigation and, uh, and complaints. I've represented both employers and employees in Title VII, which is discrimination based on race, gender, uh, religion, national origin, et cetera. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, which um, uh, sets uh, minimum pay requirements, overtime pay, uh, exempt status for overtime, etc., cetera, um, and the National Labor Relations Act. And um, all of these acts have causes of action for employees against employers. And they also generally have uh, an anti-retaliation clause, which lawyers might describe as a right to be wrong. So if you have an employee who makes an absurd allegation against you, your first impulse might be to terminate them. You can't. If you have an employee who goes around telling everybody else how much money they make and uh, saying, how much money do you make? And again, your first uh, impulse is to terminate them. You can't. Uh, under the National Labor Relations Act, they have a right to talk about the terms and conditions of employment, and this means salaries. I've actually seen that in an employee manual of a law firm that their employees couldn't discuss salaries. Um, so what I would submit to you, what I would propose to you is um, be patient with your employees. One of the mistakes that uh, a lot of employers make is they rush to judgment. They rush to terminate. They hear only one side of a story. And uh, when you surprise an employee, I found, is when they are most likely to sue. Jack Welch, I believe it was, said, I never fired anybody who didn't know it was coming. So if you are having problems with your employees, you make the phone call like the one I've received hey, I have a problem with you, I want you to stop and listen to me, and then I'll give you a chance to respond. Now, in, in the legal process, uh, due process is loosely described as notice and an opportunity to be heard. And what I try and advise all of my employers is treat every employee as if they are a contract employee, not an at-will employee, and make sure that each of them has uh, notice and an opportunity to be heard uh, make sure that uh, you don't surprise them and make sure that there's documentation. So they have a right to be wrong, so do you. You have a right to conduct your, your own investigation and if it's reasonable, make a determination. I can't guarantee any of my clients that they're not going to be sued. I can't even guarantee my clients, uh, when I see a case is frivolous, I can't guarantee them an outcome. Uh, you know, a jury is comprised of uh, individuals who uh, weren't smart enough, right, to get out of jury duty. <laughs> so, um, just to kind of recap, and I, I realize I've been all over the place today, but um, you have an obligation to live your life as a reasonably prudent person. And you should, uh, along those lines, uh, be thinking, how do I defend myself at all times? I need to imagine the important people in my life, even myself, uh, going through series of events that would be unfortunate, like a car accident, like a stroke, a divorce. Uh, you have a business partner and he goes through a divorce, you don't want his ex-wife asserting an equitable interest on your business. And so one of the things that lawyers can do is to help you uh, paper around that. Uh, we've been trained to, uh, well, it's a doctorate in jurisprudence, basically. The doctorate of thinking like a reasonably prudent person all the time. Uh, something that I incidentally fail at from time to time, too, which is why I seek the counsel of other attorneys and, and close friends and, and others. 
But uh, for each of you, you should have documents in your life that are, are planning, preparing for a period of, uh, of death or incapacity, um, uh, planning for important priorities in your life, whatever they may be. Uh, as business people, you should have written agreements. You should have a written master service agreement with every single one of your clients that says, hey, if we get in a dispute, I want to try mediation before we go into court. Or if we get into a, a dispute, any dispute that we have is going to be tried in a court of competent jurisdiction in Lincoln, Nebraska. You're in Chicago. I'm in Nebraska. I'm not going to go to Chicago to fight with you. There's not enough money in the contract to make it worth my while. Um, with your business partners, assume that you guys are going to hate each other. Maybe not in six months. Maybe it'll take a year or three years. But somebody will be like, look, I'm the one who's doing all the heavy lifting here. I don't really think it's fair that we should be a 50-50. Well, the agreement says 50-50. It doesn't mean you can't renegotiate for the future. Uh, but make sure to have those tough conversations. Uh, along the same lines, make sure to have those tough conversations with your employees. Make sure that they have a written job description. Uh, I can tell you I have witnessed personally where employees thought they were doing what the boss wanted based on conversations with coworkers who are giving them a lot of things to do. And, and uh, at the same time, uh, the boss is like, why isn't this person performing in the key tasks that I've assigned to him? Why am I getting the feedback from what I wanted? And uh, it is a symptom of bad management if you are not having key talks with employees and they're not performing at a level that you want and providing the services that you need. And again, to quote Jack Welch, I never fired anybody who didn't know it was coming. Have those tough talks. Say, this is where you are in my perception. This is where I want you to be four months from now. And if we can get there together, great. I'm excited about having you. And if not, and you want to start looking for another job, that's OK, too. But uh, you can't be afraid to, to have the conversations. And then once you have them, document it, document it, document it. Um, finally, something else that I, I might touch on is um, the law is constantly evolving with new technology. And so one of the questions that I've asked myself recently is, as an attorney, do I need to have every email I send out encrypted? Uh, my clients, some of them in healthcare, have been sending me encrypted emails for years, and it drives me nuts because half the time I can't open the things, and then uh, I end up spending 20 minutes trying to open an email. But at the same time, I have to ask myself, what would a reasonably prudent person do? Are we at the point in technology where every email that I send out has to be encrypted? Um, if, if you live in a high crime neighborhood and somebody steals your car because you left it unlocked and you had the keys in it and they run into somebody, you can be held liable for the criminal acts of third parties if they are foreseeable. And again, this should be in the back of your mind as you're conducting your affairs and you're looking at technology and new things. Uh, another example, a company threw out its old copying machines. Those copying machines had a memory in them. Every document that that company had ever uh, copied was in their memory sticks. And those copiers that they sent out, including a lot of uh, private information, that story made the headlines. You don't want that to be your business. So there are, um, there are no one-size-fits-all rules that are easy that's going to make everything simple for you. Uh, you have to rely on much broader principles. And about the most important one that I can, that I can convey to you today is, uh, uh, like I said, protect yourself at all times. At all times, try and be thinking like a reasonably prudent person would. And uh, we can't guarantee that you're never going to get sued. Uh, but you can certainly avoid a lot of, uh, a lot of unnecessary lawsuits. And, uh, and pick the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Perry Persh, Persh Legal Services, in-house counsel at outhouse prices. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tagline I'm playing with. You know, I, uh, I do actually live in an acreage outside of Ashland, but I do have indoor plumbing. Uh, I can't say. 
I can try, tell you I would charge $250 an hour to dig yours if you, uh, if you wanted one. You mentioned uh, LLCs, you can file as an S Corp. Yes, sir. On your taxes, can you file as a sole proprietorship? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to. If you're an LLC oh, no, and, you're, no, and you're, you're, you're just filing on your own personal income taxes, I mean, if you file as an S Corp, don't you have to file as a corporation then, separate off of yours? Yeah. So the, the IRS, beginning in 1986, said we don't care how you elect to be taxed as long as you're consistent with it. So you can even change if you've historically been filing as a sole proprietorship, but you have an LLC. What you can't do is if you're a sole proprietorship, you have no corporate shell, you can't just start treating yourself as an S Corp. So you, you would have to file an LLC. That's something I can do for my clients for 500 bucks. Turnaround time is less than a week. That includes the $107 filing fee. Uh, filing as an S Corp too can help not only in providing limited liability, not only in allowing you to take dividends in lieu of regular income, uh, but it also can really help you with branding as far as someday selling your business as well. What are your solutions for employees? Uh, just a question I saw you had, and you're doing employee manuals. Oh, yes. And young women that came to them, they're not here today, but they're in that office, and that's the 360 assessment tool. Oh, thank you. Think a little bit about that. And the reason why I didn't mention it is I'm old now, and I can't even read my own slides uh, without my reading glasses. Uh, but uh, the 360 evaluation, so, in a well-managed company, an annual evaluation should be really kind of like an attaboy and putting on paper accolades because people know what they're supposed to be doing. They know uh, what they sh how they should be performing, and uh, they're doing it. There's no surprises. They're getting constant feedback, and the feedback is 360. But at your annual review, at your quarterly review, if you're having an employee uh, meeting, one of the things that I would strongly encourage you to do is do 360 reviews. So uh, too often bosses think, I'm the important one, I'm gonna tell this person how they should be doing their job, and then they have their review and they tell them how to do their job, and I actually had a boss that would speak over me if I tried uh, providing any feedback. Dup, dup, dup. I'm gonna get through this, and then, okay, thanks, get out. Um, listen to your employees. They're usually the best source of innovation that you can have and they will give you for nothing million dollar ideas. Um, nobody who has become a multimillionaire in this country has ever been able to do it alone, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, everybody needs uh, people working with them. Give them an opportunity to give you feedback at your annual reviews, et cetera, and say, uh, just say something like, tell me what can I do to help you succeed at your job? What do you need to be more productive, more effective? Uh, something else that's interesting I read not too long ago is that most employees would rather have FaceTime with the boss to get acknowledged than they would a raise. Think about how inexpensive that is. People don't quit jobs, by the way. They quit bad managers. Also, I would note, too, uh, when you go and an employee is suing you, uh, who is sitting on the jury is not a bunch of business owners. they are all uh, got too much stuff to do. It's a bunch of disgruntled employees who are happy to have the opportunity to get out of work. <laughs> Here, just one more. Please. Just one more comment about the 360s. I've had the experience through coaching and working with a particular group where you know, Jack Walters comment, you know, they never knew it was coming. The 360 can also be that tool, if you will, to help people, especially with peer reviews, help them recognize when they're not achieving. Yeah, you want their ideas and things, but when they're not achieving. So when the time comes, many times they choose to leave on their own because they recognize, not because the boss says so, but because they recognize they're not fulfilling the goals and their peers have helped encourage them to look elsewhere. Right, and, and then once again, you're not surprising them. Along those same lines, too, I would, uh, I would advise you to do exit interviews. So if you have somebody who says, uh, I'm done, say, that's great as part of the, the process, and we'll pay you for your time. 
We want to have somebody who was not a supervisor for you, somebody who was not your boss, uh, just talk to you briefly about ways to help improve the company since you're leaving. Um, it's a great way to get feedback again when somebody might be a little bit more candid about perceptions of problems in the office, but also in at least one case that I'm aware, during an exit interview, uh, a woman said, yeah, I've, I've had it, I can't work here anymore, I'm sick of so-and-so touching me all the time. Yeah, okay, you're not leaving, he's leaving. Um, so again, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't read all my bullet points, but uh, you should read them, and then if you have any questions, <laughs> any questions or concerns, feel free to call me. Please. Explain a little bit more on what a reasonable person, because it seems like that's the one thing about that drives me crazy, because it's, it's not like a line that says you do this. So a reasonable person for a reasonable action for a small business isn't the same as one for a multi-million dollar business, and like it's so subjective. So if you take the same, same conversation, same thing, you have one lawyer here, one lawyer here, it's different answers. You are absolutely correct. It is vexing because in one situation, uh, it might be one thing, and in another situation, it might be another. Uh, and, and technology changes. And so what I would say is try and take the subjective and make it objective. And one of the ways that the law allows you to do that is you could say, for example, you're a plumber. And a new type of PVC comes out. If the cost on the new type of PVC is really, really high, and only a small percentage of the plumbers are using it and only on certain jobs, it's probably not uh, necessary for you to adopt it on all jobs, even if it's the best and, and maybe it doesn't freeze and break like other pipes. But at some point, if the price comes down on it and a majority of the plumbers in the industry are doing it, uh, and then you make a bid on a job and you, and you don't put it in and the pipes freeze and break and the people are like, why didn't you use the new pipe? And you're like, well, wait, it was never specified in the contract. And they're going to be like, but it was industry standard. Well, they might have a plumber who comes in to testify then and say, everybody knows this is the pipe we use nowadays. And all the other stuff is archaic. We don't use it. This man was negligent. At the same time, you might bring in an expert witness who would say, whether or not you would use this pipe, depends upon the business code in the city. The city has never adopted this particular pipe as a necessary requirement. Therefore, my client or my, uh, you know, my client wasn't uh, negligent in not using it. But you try and pull out objective standards, and you can do that by looking at the industry. You can do that by looking at the, the uh, you know, building codes, uh, legal codes, other things like that. Um, a lot of stuff comes down to expert witness testimony, though, and that's why medical malpractice cases are so expensive. Whether or not somebody violated a standard of care is heavily fact-dependent on the particular case and, and also oftentimes requires the use of experts. Last question. As a coach or a mentor, how do we protect yourself by not going over the line and give legal advice? <clears throat> Boy, uh, that might be something where I would have to draft a, like a 15-page uh, synopsis for you. And we might even have to put in a few uh, hypotheticals. Um, I agree, it's tough. You know, your entire life, uh, somebody has been telling you what the law is, and a lot of times we don't rely on primary sources for things in our life. Um, in uh, political science, we call it heuristics. It's the shortcuts that people make with information to make decisions. And uh, I rely upon counsel from attorneys all the time when I'm in a hurry and I'm like, hey, remind me again when it comes to the notice for the deposition how many days do I need, something like that. Uh, and boy, I've been wrong from time to time, even relying on attorneys. Um, the most important thing, I guess, is always be right so that your client is never mad at you enough to report you to the Bar Association for the unauthorized practice of law for which you would be charged criminally. Uh, and then, of course, you'd probably be sued, too. So uh, I think, yeah, that's probably the most important thing is always be right. <laughs> 
but if you keep saying, you might want to pass this by your attorney, you might want to pass this by your attorney, right. yeah. well, pretty soon the client say, yeah. says, why don't I just go to the attorney and skip you? you know? Great. I would like that, actually. But... Uh, <laughs> Um, boy, uh, you know, Virginia allows for people to, quote, read for the law, where they can actually intern with an attorney for five years, take the bar exam, pass it. They don't have to go to a law school. Uh, years ago, the decision was made to make law school a graduate program so that lawyers could make more money. In a lot of places like uh, Mexico, for example, like Europe, uh, law is an undergrad four-year degree. Uh, and so I have met uh, a lot of attorneys over the years. Uh, most of them are, are by, by the way, very brilliant, thoughtful, wonderful people, just like most people in every profession. But I do meet attorneys from, from time to time, and I, I think, God, how did this person ever make it through the bar exam? <laughs> um, and so there's nothing magic about us, per se. And I, I know you guys uh, oftentimes give great advice as consultants at a much better value than uh, you know, the uh, guy who graduated first in his class from law school and clerked for a federal judge and is, is clipping his clients for $600 an hour. So I, I don't have a real satisfying answer for you at this point. And that's something that hasn't come up in my practice of law, and I have to research it. And, Somebody would probably have to pay me to do it. <laughs> so do you do a la carte types of things, like review a contract? Oh, yeah. You have to have a whole relationship um, ongoing and set up the I like, and stuff. As a reasonably prudent attorney, I like to have a written understanding between me and my clients as far as expectations and what I'm going to charge. <laughs> um, and so I have a lot of clients that may use me for a bill in tenth of an hour intervals, so they may use me for three tenths of an hour one month, and then, uh, you know, eleven hours the next. It just kind of depends. I have some clients that are so small. I had this woman from a nonprofit contact me, and she's like, "Would you file articles of incorporation for me?" And I gave her my pitch about, you know, what my standard incorporation package is and what it includes, and she's like, "Well, I have three hundred and fifty dollars," and I was like. Oh, man, everything in my body wants me to say, no, no, this is going to be horrible. I'm going to get sucked into a rabbit hole and spend 10 hours and probably end up getting sued for $350. But I still said, yeah, I'll do it. Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, ideally, you want to put in a disclaimer in your email if you're doing something a la carte and say, it is a very limited uh, scope that I'm taking on right now, and this is what you're paying me, and this is what I'm doing. Anything else comes up, it's on you. We're going to have to cut off the questions now. I'm sorry. If you have more questions, though, I'm hopeful that Perry can hang around uh, for a few more minutes and you can talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. So, yep. thank Perry, you. thank you so much for being here. Great opportunity. As a thank you, we'd like to give you a Focus Suite mug. Oh, thank you, sir. Because I'm sure attorneys are fueled by caffeine. More than you know. <laughs> I believe that.